Okay, I'm going to stand down here because I, I want to point out some things on my slides that I hope um, that might make it a bit more clear as I try and explain things. So I would like to thank the organizing committee and Leanne for inviting me to speak at your um, event. I'm always honored to do so and I think the more that we talk about this stuff and uh, you know are in the same room and, and discussing it. When I first, I, I got my PhD uh, as John said in Saskatoon here about 20 years ago. And when I first started in animal welfare, I was Joe Stuckey's first PhD student and student period. And I can tell you, it was pretty frosty. Like anybody working in animal welfare behavior, it was kind of the soft science. You were more an animal rights person than anything else. So uh, coming from that farm background really helped to kind of smooth over some of that because anytime you went on farm to, to do a project or a research project, um, people were kind of leery that you were just trying to unearth ungodly things that happened on the farm, which really wasn't true. So um, today my job is to, s my title, and at first when Leanne sent me my title, I cringed. I thought, oh, don't call it happy. As a scientist, I don't like the word happy, but I thought about it a little bit more and I thought, well, what's wrong with that? That's okay. I think we can all, we all know what we're talking about when we say happy. So as I go through the presentation, I'll, I'll, I'll put a few more words to it. But, but for right now, I'm okay with happy. And the point is we want to see how this term happy and welfare um, <coughs> relates to, to production in our environments. I think the day that we just focus on how welfare impacts um, production, those days are going because I think it's much more than that. Uh, the whole social license thing is a huge push and a huge, huge impetus to, to go forward with this work. So I'm going to first start by saying um, or reminding us that we're actually pretty good at production, improving production efficiencies. And over the years, over the last 50 years, um, these things include things like genetics, so quantitative and molecular genetics, o obviously nutrition, and you can look in any uh, research journal and half of the articles in there are about nutrition. Um, things like direct fed antimicrobials, feed inoculants, feed additives, um, and new feeds, uh, and how those affect our production efficiency, that's always a goal we have. Um, in terms of growth performance, uh, anabolic agents here, you can see some cattle on beta agonists. Um, and then, of course, health, uh, including analgesics and, and antibiotics that can help to keep our animals um, healthy and uh, our production high. One thing, when I looked at this list, I thought, and really over time, what's kind of been missing and what we haven't really paid uh, as much attention to is kind of the welfare aspects. And health and welfare go together, of course, but if you kind of look into the literature on what's been done in welfare, there were a lot of missing pieces, right? And, and actually starting to work in this area, you really, you were kind of surprised at things that hadn't been done before. So I would say that we really could improve in that area. And as, as I go forward and describe some of the experiments um, we're doing, we really hope to fill in some of the gaps in some of those areas. So before we go forward, I, I wanna look, all, all of us to agree what are we talking about when we say happy? What is happy? And so for me, and I hope all of you agree, and you can debate me if you wish, we can do it here or later <laughs> after my talk, but happy is really, we, we're talking about good welfare. And what is good welfare? It's adequate nutrition, it's adequate uh, shelter, and an ability to, to move uh, and, and be a cow, right? So. I don't think any of us in this room would argue that that's good welfare. I think that's what we aim for, that's what we do in our production systems. We're actually, most of us would be very good at picking out what's not happy, what's not in good welfare in our systems, and that's what we do on a daily basis. Pen riders do that every day. Um, we know that if an animal is not happy, if, what, if its welfare is affected, um, we, it has to shift energy away from its uh, biological functions and so you get this kind of downward spiral in the condition of the animal over time. So to me that is happy. I don't know if you agree or not. Good. 
Um, so I'm going to continue to learn, uh, use happy. Link with, between happy and production. What is it? Generally, I think we can say compromise welfare. So any stress in our system produces these um, responses and behavior or negative responses and behavior and physiology. Animals are, are um, they want to kind of maintain a balance in everything. Any, any uh, living being wants to maintain balance. So anytime it's not balanced, um, and stress, uh, that really negatively affects the animal. Stress, when we have stress, and we, we see this in our feedlot systems all this time, um, there's immunosuppression is related to stress, and we have increased morbidity, mortality, and reduced feed intake and growth goes along with that. We also have increased antibiotic use, um, <coughs> something that we try and control and, and want to limit over time. And also with uh, increased stress is increased pathogen shedding. So there's some new studies coming out saying there is a, quite a strong link between stress and pathogen shedding as well. So what about the importance of happy to the beef industry? What is that? Um, and in the past, I always started my presentations pointing out the economic aspects of that. But I've really changed now. And I think Sherry's uh, presentation before me just hit the nail on the head, like we really have to focus on animal care and the, the aspect of social license here. So that should be the first thing because if we don't have those consumers and we're not respective of things that they're thinking and wanting, then we don't even have a product to be efficient with, right? So um, it really means welfare conscious management and I think that has to be first and foremost in what we do every day. Um, then comes of course the economics, so things like growth performance. If we have poor welfare or unhappy animals, our growth performance is down. We can have drug and labor costs, uh, high drug and labor costs, and then we can even have rejection at slaughter. So if none of these things are working in our favor, uh, we have to do something different than we've been doing before. What about the importance of happy to consumers? And Sherry also had this uh, certified humane lab, uh, labels. All of these niche markets have developed um, because consumers are more aware and vocal about how their food is raised and where it's come from than ever before. Um, if you, you only need to go to Google to just search um, surveys on uh, um, humane care and animal care and you get a plethora of uh, examples of um, reports and surveys that people have done um, in terms of seeing how the um, uh, what they think about animal welfare. And you can see there's, there's survey after survey after survey. One of them said 62% of respondents favored mandatory labeling of animal welfare practices. And another, um, and these are getting older now, but US shoppers are willing to pay 20% higher prices for products um, uh, that have mandatory labeling. So um, for sure, people are aware of this and they're, again, these millennial people will buy more and more of these types of products. Um, happy and the marketplace. So here is, again, this, I took this picture in the airport. It was shortly after a &W came out with their um, statement on ethically and, and ethically raised and no hormones or steroids. And I always thought, well, what does ethically raised mean? I'm not, I'm not quite sure. They don't really emphasize what that means. But there's no doubt that um, the companies are all on board with this. The push, unlike in Europe, where regulations really drove um, the animal welfare movement at that time, uh, we have some regulations, obviously. But really, in North America, the push has been through the retailers, right? The push has been from the consumers to the retailers and back to us. So we have to be conscious, and I, I'm not a person that's uh, for regulation. I think regulations are hard to change and, and get outdated very quickly, and when you want to change them, it's hard to do so. Um, a case in point is the transport regulations. We've been waiting for those for 15 years, and somebody asked me the other day if those transport regulations are ready, and I can tell you I don't know if <laughs> <laughs> they were supposed to be ready in the fall, now in the new year, and I haven't heard anything further about it. So regulations are hard and long, and I don't think they uh, do us very well sometimes. I think where we should sit more is with standards and audits. So you can see at the back the um, codes of practice for beef, the beef codes of practice are back there. And I think as if we're all acknowledging and work together to um, 
follow what's in those standards, I think we'll, we're going in the right direction. Um, Audits, and I hate to call them audits, but I guess in, in essence they are, right? People get scared of the word audit. Um, we, call, we have called it assessment, but I guess let's be honest, we're auditing, right? We're, we're seeing what people are doing. And so um, this is one amongst the verified beef, and I actually sit on both of the committees that develop these documents. So the one that Cattle Feeders has put together to do uh, feedlot audits, I was involved in doing the piloting. We'll still continue to pilot some of of uh, those for the next little bit. And then also with the verified beef one, um, we're working on that as well. So there's huge movement in this area and I think it's timely and I think we, you know, it's the right thing to do. People always say to me, well, how do you know what happy is? Animals can't talk, they can't tell you. What's happy? How do you, how do you know that? As a scientist, how do you know that? Well, it's, it's not easy, but we think we have a toolbox of things that we can, from which we can um, indicate whether an animal is doing well or not coping with its environment. So really, what, we, what you have to start with is knowing what normal is. If you don't know what normal is, you don't know what not normal is, right? So um, a, a lot of our studies, we, we measure these th two things and we follow them very closely. Um, behavior is key. You can't ignore the animal's behavior because sometimes what, how they respond <coughs> behaviorally may be quite different than how they behave physiologically. And sometimes when you're looking at stress, you might get a stress response in the physiology but not, not the behavior. So to get the whole picture, we always try and measure both of those. Um, you should measure it non-invasive and that means by handling those animals that just handling alone can increase their stress levels, right? So if we uh, go in and take a blood sample, for example, it, that may skyrocket their uh, uh, cortisol levels, and then we're misinterpreting our data because the actual handling was worse than the, the treatments we were looking at. So actually this picture was taken at the Goodale Ranch, and we were a Goodale farm when I did my PhD. And part of what we did there was we habituated these animals to handling um, over weeks and weeks. Um, so we knew that when we branded these animals to look at the stress levels that it was really because of the branding and not because of the, the handling of those cattle. So here you can see these animals were catheterized, we trained them, um, and then we could walk up th to them very easily and take a blood sample out of the catheter rather than poke them with a needle. Um, and that really helps us sort out what our treatments are, are doing. Um, general behavior, so these are a list of things that we could potentially look at. Somebody always, people always say to me, well, behavior is so subjective. And yeah, it can be, but it can also be very measurable. So I would challenge you, you can measure, you can count the number of tail flicks an animal does as an indicator of pain. You can count foot stomping depending on if, if they're castrated. Often we see this behavior and we can count those things. They vocalize, we can count that. Escape behavior behavior, I'll show you next, looking, looking at things like respiration rate, drooling, depending on what stressor you're looking at, you can, you can really quantify a lot of these things now. So I would challenge somebody to say that it's not as scientific as some, some of the other measurements we do because we can actually count and quantify them. Here's actually something I developed here at U of S with the engineering department. And when we did my branding experiments, um, because the animals were branded in the chute and when they're squeezed down in the chute, how do you measure their response? That was one thing that we were trying to look at. And so we developed this system where we put strain gauges and load cells in the arms and, and the, uh, the head gate of the chute so we could actually measure the amount, the force in which they hit the chute, the amount of movement those animals had. So that's, that becomes very objective, right? There's the signal that comes out of that. It's very, um, it's very accurate to what the animals are doing. And so here's an accelerometer. We also place that on the head gate. And so here you can quantify what the animal's re escape response is very clearly. So pretty scientific. It's, it's not just a score from one to five like we used to do. Um, now we have other devices to measure rumination, lying, standing, and stride length. This collar actually uh, monitors the amount of rumination an animal does. Uh, we know that when an animal's stressed, rumination goes down. Um, these hobo data loggers, so essentially they're accelerometers we know in a feedlot pen. Uh, we put it on the back leg and we can see it quantifies the amount of time they spend lying and standing within a day. So 
if we implement, say, for example, uh, they've gone on a long transport trip and another group has gone on a short transport trip, we can assess how fatigue by looking at the amount of lying and standing behavior those two groups of animals have. This is something actually Joe Stuckey uh, developed here at U of S and we use it all the time, um, stride length. And this animal has just been castrated. As it walks out of the um, building uh, where we just ha castrated it in the chute, we actually videotape it. And you can see here we can measure quite quite uh, uh, nicely the, the length and stride that that animal has. And I can tell you that's very telling because if you have just castrated that animal, this distance shortens up a lot. They're very tentative in how they walk. So it can, becomes a very measurable and good measure of um, what an animal may be feeling. Um, when we give that same animal anesthetic, it goes back to normal. So it becomes another way in which we can kind of quantify or measure some of the things that the animals are feeling. Um, physiology. Well, there's a whole raft of things here. We commonly use uh, cortisol as a stress hormone. We measure it in blood. We measure it in saliva. And we can now measure it in hair. We've developed in my lab a, um, a method for hair. And what's nice about hair cortisol is that it's a measurement of chronic issues. So unlike a blood sample, which is a moment in time, and you can only say it if you do, if you castrate that animal and 15 minutes after, yes, it, its cortisol rises. With the hair cortisol, it's deposited in the hair shaft over months or over weeks. And so there we can get a kind of a chronic measure, something that we haven't been able to do very well before. Um, catecholamines, we have a new thing, and we're working with a lab in, in, at Iowa State, substance P, it's a neuropeptide, it's a specific biomarker of pain. So this is really nice for us because lots of people will say, well, it's stress, but you know, how do you know it hurts? So this uh, neuropeptide is very specific to pain. Um, and then we look at immune function, so white blood cell counts, those kinds of things. These acute face proteins we use quite a bit, and, and they, uh, also give us a good indication of, of uh, if an animal is stressed or not. I don't know, Leanne, what did I do? I'll keep going. Uh, infrared thermography and heart rate, we use these as well. Infrared th thermography is very good to look at things like inf inflammation or fever. We use it a lot in, in our castration experiments where we are trying to look at inflammation. Um, heart rate, you can see these animals uh, they have the, the girth belts on and the heart rate monitors are underneath those belts. These animals actually came off a transport study that we did. And amazingly, those heart rate monitors stayed on the whole. I think they were in transit 15 hours, which was amazing that they could actually stay on. But we got good readings throughout that transport journey so we could see what was happening um, and where the animals found certain things uh, stressful, whether it was starting and stopping or um, being loaded onto the truck and so on. So these are our, our management practices that can reduce happiness. I think we all know what they are. Um, our, my group has worked in most of these, and the next slides that I'll be showing you actually um, are the kind of like some of the culmination or summary of, of the work that we've done in the last uh, five to ten years. So, so just some general statement here uh, about castration and dehorning. Regardless of age, um, there's strong scientific evidence that castration and dehorning cause pain and stress in animals. That's a, that's a blanket statement. I don't think anybody can argue that. Um, as those animals increase in age and size, the trauma for those procedures increases. So as the testicles grow in size, as the horns grow in, in size, um, the tissue that are in, the, the amount of tissue involved in doing that procedure is larger and then it's just much harder on the animal. So, um, and the complications are increased, of course. So increased ri risk of infection, blood loss, and in some cases, death. So we're really, we know this. Do op to optimally uh, um, do these procedures very young to minimize the pain and the stress on those animals. So as early as possible, because otherwise we have impacts on growth performance um, and reduced welfare. Um, we know that young calves have fewer and less severe signs of pain during and after castration and dehorning. We actually are involved in a, it's, it's a large five-year study funded f by BCRC on castration, and this specifically looking at the age of castration. So 
in young animals because obviously we want to remove it from the feedlots. We don't want feedlot guys to have to deal with that. These procedures need to be done early. So the question became, and as we were developing the beef codes of practice, we realized that there, were no, there was no research to say, well, what, what age beyond which do you need to use anesthetic or analgesics? And so the question we're trying to answer, one of the questions we're trying to answer is um, early age. We tested zero, so within one week of age, two months of age, and four months of age. And those studies are ongoing as we speak. <coughs> Um, hopefully I can speak to you at a different time to show you what the results of those things are. But at this moment in time, I can say pr quite generally that obviously the well, fitting what we believe the youngest age group, so the one week of age group, is showing less signs of severe pain rather than the two to four months of, uh, group of age. We'll continue on with that work and that study will be done in 2018. Um, there was one study here, effects of surgical and band castration on 14-month-old bull was so negative that the bull castrated, bulls castrated at nine months of age had similar weights, uh, removing any benefit of the longer, or longer exposure to testosterone. So there's, there's quite a bit of scientific evidence showing that this is um, reducing performance. Um, and a study that we did uh, looking at performance and castration um, calves castrated at six to eight month of, months of age, which when the, would be when they came into the feedlot as receiving cattle, um, was reduced compared to those castrated at one month of age. <clears throat> Here's an example, and I just want to show you this kind of this common stress peak that we see in castrated animals. So this is the per, uh, amount of salivary cortisol along the side, so we measured it in the saliva. And this is the time relative to castration along the bottom from zero hours up to 14 days past castration. You can see the, the red line with the solid red triangles is those animals that were castrated without anesthetic and analgesic. And this is very characteristic of what we get. This huge peak lasts, starts to come down after about two hours, but this peak is removed when we give those same animals medication. So we know that our anesthetics and analgesics are working because this stress peak is removed um, when we give it to them. In terms of production, um, this was one of the earlier studies that we did. So this is dry matter intake in kilograms along the bottom. The blue is banned, red is surgical castration, the green is not castrated. And so you can see feed intakes in the first two weeks after we did these procedures that there was no difference between the band and control groups, which we would expect, but the surgical animals have reduced feed intake. Um, and we attribute that to those animals um, still being in pain and dealing with that surgical castration. Another nice thing that we see here, this pink bar is not medication, medicated, so animals not given any pain control. And the green here is medicated, so you can see that the animals given pain control actually increase their intake in that period of time. Final body weight, very similar here. Again, final body weight along the side. The, the band and surgical animals um, had lower body weight than the controls, which makes sense. Obviously, the controls still had testosterone on board till that time. But one nice thing that we really saw here in this trial was non-medicated animals had significantly uh, lower final body weight by four kilograms than those given medication. So there is some evidence that those things ha do, do impact performance without question. Um, res other results we had on average daily gains. So this is up to six weeks post castration here. The blue line is the band, red line again is surgical castration and the green are controls. You can see here in the first week the surgical animals, their average daily gain is down. They really go off feed for that first week. Um, and the bands, the, no difference between the banded animals and the controls. But we were really shocked, this is one of the first studies in which we saw this, that at this three to four week period, um, the banded animals really went off feed and we thought, well, what the heck's going on there? And we decided to look a little bit further because it didn't make sense to us. But at about that three to four weeks of age is when the band starts to really cut through the tissue and where some of the testicles start to fall off. And this is if you've ever looked closely, that's what it looks like. And so that's a really big portal for infection and bacteria to get in, especially if you're laying on um, straw that's got manure on it. Uh, and so it really fits. So this, this is a pretty busy slide here, but 
this, these are temperatures that we took with the infrared camera over the, the, the scrotal area after the castration. So this picture is taken um, uh, from surgical castration at about two days after the surgery. And you can see this yellow area really looks inflamed, like the, the hotter the temperature here is indicated on the, on the scale on the right side. And so it makes sense here. We see this red bar in terms of the temperature that really increases in the first couple of days for surgically castrated animals. But as you see, this week 14 to week 28, those banded animals, we, that's where we saw the greater inflammation and that matched with the feed intake information. And this is what we're seeing. And that inflammation really increases and it's in the area above the band, above where the band was. Um, you can see by day 35, this is the dead necrotic tissue um, from the testicle here. There's the band itself and whoops, you can still see how, uh, how inflamed, whoops, sorry, how inflamed this area above the band still is. So that it was a really, it made a really nice story for us, but it's just a way we, we can explain um, what's happening in the production as well. So benefits of pain mitigation pre and post castration. Um, this is a study we did and some others as well. Improvements in feed intake and average daily gain in surgically castrated calves given a combination of anesthetics and analgesics, no question. We did see reduced E. e. coli shedding because we measured E. coli in these animals. And uh, another study, down at, study done at Iowa State, uh, oral meloxicam given to animals for castration they didn't see any difference in effect on castr the castration treatments, but what they did find was a reduction in BRD uh, to the con control group. So they're um, looking at this in terms of BRD control as well. Benefits of pain mitigation pre and post dehorning. So growth rates of calves dehorned six weeks after auction purchase were 30% lower than calves dehorned prior to auction um, or born pulled. So Again, some, some benefit there in terms of doing this. Uh, growth still 4.5% uh, lower, 160 days, 106 days after dehorning. And then also uh, differences in average daily gain. Dehorned calves given meloxicam um, was 1.58 versus 0.8 for controls. So hoping to give you evidence that this is in fact helping production. Um, another study that we've just, um, we're at the end of now, well, we have our final report due to ELMA soon, um, but occurrence and characterization of risk factors associated with lameness in Alberta feedlots. Some of the preliminary, preliminary results I'll give you here. Um, when we first started this study, um, we recognized that re there's really very little research on lameness in feedlot cattle. Most of it's done in dairy. Uh, a lot of it's done in dairy. And when we went to the literature, we didn't find much there. There were some studies done uh, down in the US and one study done here by uh, Hugh Townsend say, saying 17% of cattle, all feedlot cattle were treated for lameness. Um, and then the study in the US, 16% treated and 5% mortality related to lameness. And we decided to look at this little, a little further. So we actually did put in for money for this study and people said, well, lameness isn't a problem in feedlots. Would you agree with that? <laughs> if you've ever been into the chronic pen at a feedlot, what are most of the animals are lame, right? So we actually did a little pilot study on our own to see what this looked like. And incidents, we found that incidents in chronic pen vary between 32 and 52% Average of 37% of cattle were lame, uh, and others were tre and treated less than others for their pathologies because we just don't know how to treat them. We don't know when the prognosis, how will they improve, what does that look like? They're difficult, lamenesses are difficult to treat. Um, another study here incidence of lameness increased after processing, so there's some link to handling cattle and them becoming lame thereafter. In terms of production losses, increased days on feed, two weeks longer to reach slaughter weight, one study says. Uh, lameness, uh, lame cattle gain more slowly than non-lame cattle. Uh, that's something that we found in ours, 1.75 versus 2.9 pounds per day. The cost of foot rot in a study, uh, and this is a dairy study, 
$33, and digital, digital dermatitis, it's a new uh, thing we're seeing in the feedlot, um, and that's in US dollars for treatment in dairy cattle, and we're not sure at this point in feedlot cattle, uh, at least in Canada. So we really wanted to focus on looking at the risk factors and the types of lameness that we were seeing, and trying to characterize that and relate it back to some risk factors. So some of our obje objectives of this study determine occurrence of lameness in the healthy and chronic pens, uh, characterize the types of lameness observed and their potential cause, identify environmental and managerial, managerial factors associated with lameness, and then of course to look at the relationship to economics and what those diseases are actually cause, uh, costing us. Uh, we did a, a health uh, record study and a live animal study as part of this work. Um, these are some of the most common types of lamenesses we're seeing to date. Obviously, foot rot is a big one, but I can tell you they are not all foot rot. As you see, if you look at the health records, everybody puts foot rot, foot rot, foot rot, and that's fair because actually, as doing part of the study, every when we went into the feedlot, um, and we did this uh, weekly for two years, we went to the feedlots and they pulled their lame animals for the day, and we brought all of those, each one of those animals in and picked up the feed on each and every one of those animals to do a thorough assessment of what was happening here. Um, whether it was in the claw or whether it was up higher in the proximal limb and we were able to get a better diagnosis of what that looked like. Um, so obviously common things here, laminitis is something we see, lots of swollen joints as well. Here's digital, <coughs> digital dermatitis. It's, uh, it's caused by a, a bacteria, treponin, treponine species, and this has actually mostly occurred in the dairy industry up until a few years ago, and now we're seeing it a lot in the feedlot. In fact, some of the lots that we worked with, it was a huge problem, and it's very painful from what we can see, the, the lameness severity caused by this um, pathogen can be quite severe. It has different stages. Uh, this stage, which is the M2 stage, is the most painful um, stage of the, the disease process and the characteristic look, it usually shows up on the heel bulb and then uh, what you actually see as the, the disease advances is that these looks like kind of sh a shag rug at the very back of the bulb of the heel and it may improve from this stage or it may just continue in a circle from that point. Um, so something we really need to look at. At this moment, the guys are using chlorotetrine chlorotetracycline foot baths, but um, it's really hard to get rid of at this point, so people are continuing to do research with this. Uh, toe tip or P3 necrosis, how many of you guys have seen this or had this in any of your lots? So this is typically something uh, that happens on animals, very excitable cattle, and we were actually very fortunate to follow a group of animals um, that had been brought back from an auction market from a feedlot and these animals what happens is they uh, through some injury and we think when they get loaded onto the truck they they uh, scratch the surface of their sole and so so you get this um, opening between the the white line and the and the claw of the the hoof and then you get this opening where bacteria can get in and um, once those bacteria are in and sometimes it's just a very small pinhole that starts it and that affects the, the P3 bone and can in fact liquefy the P3 bone. So um, again, very uh, severe and uh, painful condition for the cattle. Usually what happens is we tip these animals and it opens, relieves the pressure within that hoof claw, which really helps them. And <clears throat> we follow these animals through from the time that we brought them to our research facility, but they did heal. They did heal amazingly because we thought we would just have to, to tank them. They wouldn't be worth anything, but over weeks and weeks, we had to keep them very um, kind of in a, a smaller side pen, um, not move them very much, but, but they did improve. So results so far of that study, health records, 22% of all cattle treated uh, at least once in those records, and 27% of those were treated for lameness. So that turns out to be about 7%. When we classified them into the following categories, foot rot, injury, uh, joint infection, and lameness with no swelling, 76% were classified as having foot rot, so uh, that, that appears to be the case. But what I would tell you is, and what, and what we're finding is, the difference between a foot rot 
and a digital dermatitis gets very difficult to find. And sometimes they'll have a combination of those two things. Um, and so the diagnostics around that gets pretty tricky. Um, cost between 13, uh, about 13, or sorry, $14 Canadian um, per animal, and foot rot accounted for about 26% of the total treatment cost. Uh, this is not surprising, foot rot right now, pre most prevalent in the spring and the fall, obviously uh, associated with wet feedlot conditions. Um, we have a lot more data coming out of this. We're just at the end of finishing this report, so we'll, sometime in the future I'll be able to you'll be able to see some of these results. In terms of the live animals uh, data, right now what we had looked at for lameness score, for example, gait score, um, lameness asso associated with the proximal limbs, so swollen hip, uh, stifle, fetlock, and hock, had higher gait scores, meaning that they were more severe gait scores, more severe lameness than those animals with claw lesions. Um, some preliminary results, so if you remember I told you this substance P is an indicator of pain in those animals. We did collect that variable in those lame cattle. And you can see um, here, we were quite uh, happy to see that you can see differences between treatments. The biggest one we saw was showing that swollen joint was more painful some, than some of the other conditions that we uh, were looking at, which actually surprised us somewhat. But this will help us pull apart to, to actually know the effects and what's happening within those animals and whether it, you know, it just changes the gait or whether it continues to be painful for those cattle. How much time do I have left? 15 minutes. Um, how much time, Leanne, or am I done? Three minutes? Five minutes. Okay. <laughs> so we've done a lot of work on transport, um, and I'm not going to have time to go through all of this with you. Uh, but over the last, say, seven years, um, we, we first started doing this work when they wanted to change the transport regulations and the producers came to me and said, you know, we don't, we don't like what they're trying to change, can you kind of look into this? And so we know it's a stressor and we know that um, the animals can act, have uh, really negative outcomes to transport. The number one letter to the Minister of Agriculture still, and when we started this study, and still to this day is transport, because it's one of the most visible parts of our industry to the public. Um, we set out to answer some questions here, <coughs> looking at minimum and maximum loading density, di transport distances, feed of water and rest intervals and delays, incidence of down, injured and data animals, and that the relationship of those things to the type of truck, the driver experience, breed, sex, age, weight <coughs> class of the cattle, and so on. Um, some of the results from that uh, relationship between temperature and shrink. So for every one degree rise in ambient temperature, the shrink increased by 0.04%. So it gave us an indication of kind of what's happening there with those animals. This slide I really like because it, it's very informative to us if, if people want to know kind of where some of those cutoffs should be. So, here is shrink along the side and body weight and time on the truck in hours. You can see that at, at about that 30 hour mark, the, the shrink starts to plateau. And some producers said to me, well, does it matter then? I can, I can transport those animals as long as I want because they're not gonna lose any more weight after that. Is that the right interpretation of that slide? No. <laughs> no, it isn't because what happens here it's not water loss anymore, it's tissue loss, right? So we don't want to get to that point. We don't want to get to that plateau. We want to move it at about that 28 hour mark where or before. So if I had to set some rules around what I think should be the longest time in transport, I would say about that 24 to 28 hours, given this data. Um, here again, shrink in body weight and mean temperature along the bottom. You can see at about that 15 degree mark, it really starts to increase rapidly. So this gives us some, some indications on uh, what temperatures and, and how long we should have animals in transport. Um, the effective time in truck and temperature on welfare outcomes. So here we're looking at lame animals, dead animals and downers and the total culmination of that. You can see again at that 28 hours, those really start to skyrocket. So again, how it fits with the rest of the story, and if I have to pick a level, I would say it's at that 24-hour mark. Um, space allowance, very similar um, things here. So 
probability of becoming uh, totally compromised. So that's all of these dead, down, or lame. And you can see body when that's related to body weight loss. So as the animals increase in their body weight loss or shrink, incidence of these things in increase and probably starts to increase more rapidly at about 9% shrink. So transport conclusions, we made quite a few, and I, I think those some of those will be in the transport regulations coming out, but I'm not sure because I'm not privy to that information. Um, as I said, it, it, it's uh, that exceeding 30 hours is not good. Longer journeys at higher temperatures, not good. Um, we looked at this loading density and anything above 0.5, greater than, uh, lower than 0.5 or greater than 1.75 meters squared per animal, we saw increases in welfare issues in those cattle. So finally, I've just got a few couple more slides here, uh, Leanne. A perfect example, a cum culmination of what stress can do to our production systems and our loss of production and increase in costs and labor and drugs is BRD. So um, any management practices, practice causing stress has a potential to increase herd mortality and morbidity. Uh, that's been shown time and time again. And what happens, um, obviously, shipping fever, those animals are are weaned, sometimes weaned, put on a truck, mixed with other animals, uh, gone through an auction market and so on. And so that's a really high stress period of time and not surprising that those animals become sick once they get into the feedlot. BRD we know is a leading cause of morbidity in our, in our industry still and we're still trying to do a lot of work with it. Um, so there's no question that unhappy cattle or calves coming in can have huge problems in terms of uh, health and then that really affects our production and, and our pocketbooks too. Same thing here, vaccine efficiency and e efficacy uh, um, get reduced once we have a stress situation and animals um, are immunosuppressed. So then they aren't as effective as they could be as well. Other production losses or areas of include things like Buller syndrome, high concentrate feeding, um, Greg Penner, if he was here, might argue with me, but we can have that as a debate for another day. Um, morbidity, early detection of illness is something we can work on. And then the effects, we should never forget about this, the effects of new technologies. So anytime we have new technologies that improve our performance, we always need to make sure we know what their impacts are on the animals and the animal welfare itself. A case in point, I think all of us know the the story of the beta agonist that got taken off of the market and it was strictly on a welfare issue. It was nothing else. So I think we, as we get some of these new products in the market, we can't ignore the effects that they have on welfare. So our take home for today, uh, sustainable and profitable beef production will only be accomplished through welfare conscious management. Good welfare or happy um, really equals sustainability. And we will continue to achieve this through education, uh, such as this event, and then continuing of research and on-farm welfare audits as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, we Thank can you. take uh, a quick question.